Monday, May 8th, one day before E3, I guess E3 already started, whatever. <laughs> this is Geek Nights, and today we're going to talk about P2P, but really we're just kind of rushed through it so we can hurry up and talk about E3 tomorrow. Let's do this. Tomorrow is the first full day of the Electronic Entertainment Expo of 2006. It's actually started right now. That means all the video game news in the entire universe is going to come out within the next 24 to 36 hours. It's already begun. You can go to dig. But while I'm saying this, which is probably hours or perhaps even a day before you're listening. It is currently 9.37 p.m. in Rim and Scott time. Eastern. So it's 8, 7, it's 6.30 in California where the E3 2006 is happening. Already we're seeing such reports as <laughs> microphones and speakers in the Wii controller. Yep, various Final Fantasy bits. Yeah, Final Fantasy 13, two different Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles games. I think the Square Enix conference must be going on. Yeah. But uh, it's getting really crazy up in here. WarioWare. Uh, oh, there's a Time Magazine article of someone who played the Wii. WarioWare Wii, everybody. WarioWare Wii. Wii! It's only going to get crazier. Tomorrow, the episode of Geek Nights you will listen to will have nothing but E3 stuff. Even the things of the day and the news will all be E3. Yep. And while we're not going to be at E3 actually covering it... Because we suck. I can say with a fair amount of certainty that at least by the next E3, there's a decent chance we'll be there. Maybe. We'll pull it off. Yeah. The thing about E3 is that you don't really need to go because there's even a website now that's up. It's a BitTorrent tracker that is hosting only torrents, which are videos and audios of things going on to E3. And all the videos are in HD. So you can really see that nerd. Yeah, the only thing you have to gain by going to E3 as opposed to just watching E3 on the internet or satellite feed is actually playing all these games a few months before they hit the shelves. Well, and the general fun of being at a con. Yeah, of course, it's crazy crowd. It's not a con. It's more of a trade show. You yeah, know, but... That's uh, the thing. Most people who seem to go and have a good time are the ones who go to the crazy after parties. Yeah. And during parties. The thing is, it seems like every single group that goes has their own separate party. It's like I go to like four or five different video game websites, and they all have their own separate party. It's like, we're having the E3 get drunk party. We're having the E3 get even more drunk party. Woo! <laughs> You know? I don't know. So, let's refrain from talking about E3 anymore today. Yes. Though in other more horrible news, um, the trees in the Mid-Hudson Valley have decided to lay down a bombardment upon my nose with little pollen bombs. I have been laid upon the same bombardment, yet I am immune, for I am superior genetically in all ways. Yeah. Well, I have this Maginot line of allergies. So they just walked around through Belgium, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Way to go, Belgium. I've got so much Benadryl and Sudafed and various other things that I had to sign little logbooks for to get that it's not even funny. And I've got a headache and my nose hurts. Yeah, he's a druggie. I saw him leaving his pills around the bathroom. Yeah, that uh, Loratadine. Yeah, I just we don't have a phone, so I can't call for help. So anyone who has a phone, <laughs> just call like the drug whatever line and tell them that Rim is a big addict and needs to go to rehab. Though also today, I actually had a doctor's appointment for that new job. Because I quit IBM. I'm, not, I'm just kind of screwing around at work now for the last two weeks. Yeah, I screwed around at work today. Actually, I'm doing more work now that I've told them I quit than I was doing before. Lol. As they start panicking and asking me things like, how do we do all that stuff you've been doing for the last three years? Lol. Though at least I drove down to the city. I have to get tested for tuberculosis as part of the fact that I'm going to be working in hospitals. And I've got a little ball on my arm now that's full of tuberculin. And as long as it doesn't turn in big and red, I get the job. I'm going to take this red marker at tonight and go... Yeah, and then I'll go in, you know, 48 hours from now, and the doctor will say, you've got a bad case of Sharpie. <laughs> awesome. Though, interestingly enough, when I got to the city, my allergies disappeared. I felt great. Because there's no trees there. <laughs> oh, there are, just not whatever bastard tree lives up here. Oh, there are, just aren't enough trees there. Oh, well, anyway, we got some actual news, too. Okay. So, Vim. V-I-M. The not... only text editor that real men use. Yeah. 
and not talking about the underwear company or anything like that, because I think there's an underwear company named Vim, isn't there? Uh, there's also an underwear company named Rim. Yep. They uh, make pretty des- cool designer boxers. <laughs> All right, we're going to forget about Rim. <laughs> Vim is <laughs> the VI Enhance whatever text editor. It's a very, very important piece of software, whether you know about it or not. Yes. In, in one, even not in terms of history, but in terms of usefulness now, you're guaranteed, no matter what Linux, Unix, whatever system you're on, VI is in there if nothing else is. Yep. No matter which computer in the entire universe you are using, be well, it... Well, if it's a Unix, Linux, BSD. Yeah, yeah. Any Unix, Linux, whatever computer in the world has VI or VIM on it. I guarantee it. Windows, and I don't know if Macs might have it pre-installed, but if they don't, you can install it. Vim will work on any computer anywhere. It's completely free and completely available, and it works the same no matter what system you're using, guaranteed. We've talked about it before. It's incredibly powerful. It is, however, some would say, obtuse. Yeah, it's not easy to learn, but it's easy to use. Once you've learned it, you're awesome. Escape colon WQ. Yeah, we definitely had this discussion before. Yeah, we did. The difference between easy to use and easy to learn... Vim is the not easy to learn but easy to use text editor. All it does is edit text files. But it edits them real well. And usually it just edits source code for programming. That's its its primary function. Its secondary function is system administrating configuration files, which it does equally well. Vim 7 came out today. Previously, we were using Vim 6. Vim 7 is light years beyond Vim 6. Now... And- to someone who doesn't use Vim, you would open up Vim 7 and say, this looks exactly the goddamn same thing. Wait, it looks the same. It's a big black screen with a little colon in the bottom left and a blinking cursor somewhere. And that's how you know they didn't fuck it up when they switched to version 7. Because <laughs> it didn't change a goddamn thing. What they did add are the following. Number one, on-the-fly spell checking, all Microsoft Word style. Ooh, that's something I've actually kind of wanted. Yeah, because Vim didn't have a spell checker, so you would occasionally try to write things in it and screw up, and it sucked ass because there's no way to spell check. Well, you could spell check by, you know, piping things through something, mm-hmm. but not easily. Mm-hmm. Not in a way that non-nerds would know how to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it can now is capable of printing multi-byte text, so now you can Vim in Chinese and Japanese and kanji. Yep, the net result of that is that Russian. they've added, I think, 50 languages they actually translated the manual pages into all those languages as well. Whoa, badass. And there's an internal grep, which is faster than the previous uh, internal grep. And it is portable, so it works on every machine. Now, you might wonder, why do I care if grep is fast or slow? It's the text editor. There are some big fucking text files out there. And if you want to grep them, it could take you minutes to grep them. If you know what grepping is. If you don't know what grepping is, what are you listening to? <laughs> well, I guess you control F-ing. Yeah. <laughs> F3-ing. Ooh. No, it's actually forward slash, regular expression forward slashing. Yeah. Yeah. Or, if you're awesome, G slash, regular expression slash S slash slash, regular expression slash G. G. Okay. R. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Vim is awesome, and it got more awesome. Yep. The last thing they added is, you know how Visual Studio does that thing where, you know, you'll do, like, you'll be typing some code, and you'll do something like something dot whatever, and then this big list will appear, and you can just choose something out of the list. It knows all the functions, and you can just pick them instead of having to type them. Vim has that now. Uh, for what languages? All of them? A lot of them. All the big ones. <laughs> all the ones we care about. C, Java, Ruby, Python, you know. Yeah, Python's stuff. what I really need. Yeah. Because I like Python and I use it, but I don't remember much about it because I only use it to replace things that are obtuse to do in Bash. This is really helpful for someone like me because I know the syntax and use of a lot of languages. Like, I know the basic structures of a language and what type of language it is and how to use it, but I don't remember, like, the actual specific names of the built-in standard functions of a language or the, you know, like in Ruby, I know how to use a block to do a certain thing. I don't remember the actual name of the function that, like, cuts off the spaces at the end of a string. But you know the function exists. Yep, so this can help me find it because I can, like, be like, was it chop or was it chomp or was it schomp? You know, and I can try to type it in to see, you know, and, and I'll find it. 
Now, I guess, I mean, the news we just gave, you either cared about this and said woot, or you have no idea what we just said. If you cared about this and said woot, you're an awesome programming nerd of computering. If, if you, you did not, then you're not so awesome. Nah, nah, if you didn't, because, I mean, a lot of people don't. And I'll admit that I never used VI or Vim until I got to RIT. I didn't even know what it was before I got to RIT. I used to use, I had Pico that mm. I'd used occasionally on, like, this crapo Linux box. No, when I got to RIT, they told me about Vim, but they had they told all the first year CS guys to use Emacs, which I used, uh. but I didn't like it, so I used NEdit, which is a lot more like Notepad, and but no, but it had better colors and stuff. So then I used NEdit for a long time, and NEdit's actually a lot better now than it used to be, and it's still kind of nice. I kind of you know. But then once I really got into using Vim, now it's like everything else is just whatever. Yeah, when I was a freshman, they said use Pico, VI is there, but that's for advanced people, and I thought. Well, I don't know what either of those is, really, so I'm just going to use VI. <laughs> and it was tough, but then I learned it, and I realized how awesome it was. Yep, once you learn, you know, important letters to press, like O, yeah, and Y, and D, and though, S. If you're, if you, I mean, I highly recommend anyone out there, learn to use VI at least minimally. Yeah, it seems to be that a lot of people who try to use VI once, and they realize it takes a lot of learning... You'll see them post comments on like dig and slash dot like if you don't want to spend the two years it takes to learn VI, just use like uh, my awesome editor, Subetha Edit, which is I guess is cool. I never actually used it, but a lot of people say good things about it. Or they'd be like, yeah, if you don't want to bother learning all this crazy useless crap, then do this. And then the other kind of posts are like, here are all the commands. Oh my god, <laughs> here's how to do that in one, you know, in, in by type pressing three buttons. The way to learn VI or anything complicated like that is to learn the basics. Mm -hmm. Be able to make a little quick file and then save it and then delete it and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Then, every time you're using VI and you think, man, it'd be great if I could just do blah, stop, look up how to do blah, and then do it. And you'll remember it and you'll learn stuff real quick that way. Yep, and a lot of people will be like, oh man, it takes like three years to learn VI. It takes like a week to learn VI unless you're a doofus. Well, it takes years. You just have to actually do it. It takes years to learn all the crazy tricks. I don't learn all the crazy tricks. I just learn the ones that I actually use. Yeah, I The mean, ones that you don't use on a regular basis, just look them up. I mean, all I really use on a regular basis, other than the, the basic, basic, basics, are like I do some substitutions and, you know, find and replace type stuff, or copy-pasting, or... Yank put. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, just remember that whenever you're in like a notepad or the next time you're doing something with text editing or word processing and you have to like copy and paste something like a billion times and then edit like a little tiny bit on each line, just think if you were using VI and you bothered to learn it, you could probably do that by pushing like five keys on your keyboard and pressing enter. Just so you know. Plus, you'll, if you know VI at all, you'll never be in the situation of Oh, I gotta fix my box, but I, I can't load X, and I don't have anything that edits text except that VI thing. Yeah, remember how said VI is on every computer there is, or at least every Unix computer? It's because other word processors aren't. So if you're an Emacs guy, Emacs is kind of big and eh, you know? And if you don't learn how to use VI at all, you might one day be having to fix a configuration file on some Unix machine, and it doesn't have Emacs or NEdit or Pico or Nano or anything, but it'll have VI. Of course, I had to fix the Unix machine once where VI, I couldn't even get to work properly because I didn't even know what terminal to set up. Wow. Because it was this Unix machine, and it didn't use VT But standard. it had VI, though. It had VI oh, in there. Oh, there you go. Same, it's, the thing is, <laughs> you know. I couldn't even make the arrow keys work. I had to use JK and all that. So even if VI is not your editor of choice, learn VI. And know that VIM is infinitely better than VI, but some old-ass computers only have VI. Now, usually on a computer, if you type VI, it'll actually just run VIM. Yep. Very few people actually have VI. New modern computers that you're likely to use, that's the case. And what we're talking about here is VIM7, not Vim, not VI. VI is kind of dead. <laughs> no one likes it. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. All right, so HP and Dell and Lenovo have decided to do something stupid yet again. Great. They have decided that, you know, uh, DVI and the UDI or HDMI and VGA and that other one, all those standards of hooking monitors up to computers, they're all no good. They're going to make a new one. What's wrong with DVI? Uh, DVI isn't as DRM'd as they'd like it to be. It doesn't have any DRM. And they claim that DVI doesn't have enough bandwidth. You're kidding. DVI can have like a hajillion resolution with perfect. 
Actually, DVI does max out at uh, 1920 by something, unless you use DVI B, which actually a lot of cards don't support. The best digital TV in the world doesn't go that high. Oh, yeah, but if you have a crazy monitor or something. And people with crazy monitors get those things with the two DVI cables coming out. Keep in mind, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I'm just saying what they say. Mm-hmm. Now, the advantage of DisplayPort, which is what they're calling this bullshit, is that it's somewhat backward compatible with all those other standards. Or at least, oh, with, the, at least, good. At least with DVI. That's good. But it, you know, it has the DRM, and they say it has so much more bandwidth. Mm-hmm. It has almost not more bandwidth. It like, <laughs> barely edges DVI out. Uh, all right. But they're going to make it standard on all their new PCs. Okay. I don't know what they're trying to accomplish. It's like... Every time a format that has DRM in it fails, they make another worse format, assuming that somehow this one will succeed. Didn't they notice that Apple is the one winning the music? See, they were actually talking about this in some other podcast today, how Apple has DRM and so do all the other music guy, music stores online, right? But the Apple DRM is really, they're like, okay, how can we put DRM without the customer ever noticing? And if you don't know this DRM and you don't try to do something like copy music, you know, badly, the Apple DRM will never, you'll never see it and it'll never get in your way. <laughs> All the other guys, the people who made that, didn't care about the customers, they cared about the record companies. So that DRM just gets all in your way all over the place. Yeah, like I got this little Sony recorder bit that I use to do interviews now at cons. Mm-hmm. It, it's great. Except for the fact that it has such horrible shit DRM that the only way to get the files off of it is to boot it, boot my computer into Windows, run this horrible application that then gets the encrypted data off of this thing. Wow. In a crippled format, nonetheless. So now here's the thing. I can understand how you want to plug up the analog hole, right? And that's, that's a good thing, I guess, from a DRM if you're an evil bastard. Except the analog hole really means, guess what? I have eyes. I can see it. If I can see it, I can record it. Fuck you. Yeah. But here's the thing. Who the hell right now is ripping movies by plugging in recorders to the DVI port? They're see, not because they've broken the DRM before that point. And they're, why, you know, you're, blo- you're, you're making a DRM where no one's bothering to go, assuming that your other DRM is like rock solid or will be rock solid. Well, it never I, will be, ever. What I think their plan here is that currently people have broken the first stage, the software DRM, but they haven't really gone after the hardware so much because they haven't had to. I think they want to get good hardware DRM out there and ubiquitous and keep putting it out there so that when they finally make DRM that's harder to break, suddenly we're backed into a corner. I'm not saying it's going to work, but I think that's what they're thinking. It's never going to work. DRM will never, there will never, ever, ever be a DRM that hackers will not break if they want to. Ever. I mean, even if there were a magical quantum thing that could make actual DRM, you still have to output it to some form of analog because you have speakers. The speakers make sound. If anything, I put a microphone in front of that speaker. Yep. You can't stop that. No. Nope. Ever. Nope. Ever, 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 ever. Don't, uh, why don't they get it? The analog hole is just that. It's a hole. It can't ever be filled. They can just pump money into it, but it's still a hole. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, like the way Cory Doctorow says it, is DRM is a security where you give someone a goodie, but you put the goodie in a safe and you give them the key. But you, you kind of make it so that they can only open the safe, kind of. <laughs> it's like if you give someone this, their, a goodie... In a safe, and you give them the key, because you have to, or else you're not actually giving them the goodie. They're going to open it and get it out of there, no matter what you want. I just think of that Penny Arcade with the ham sandwiches in the safe way. Yeah, (laughs) it's exactly what it is. Thing of the day. Thing of the day. All right, so my thing of the day... I discovered this today, actually, even though I had other things lined up for Thing of the Day over the weekend. and it's Oh, we got a lot of Things of the Day. I already have my Thing of the Day for tomorrow, but this is horrifying E3? and hideous. It's someone made a Super Soaker-like device, only instead of being shaped like a squirt gun, it's shaped like a giant alien penis-looking thing. What? Wait, what? It looks like an alien's phallus. Wait, so this is a Super Soaker. It looks like some sort of... Like, alien-type phallus instrument of depositing semen into unwilling human hosts. So there's a super soaker that is shaped and designed like the penis of an alien. Now, that alone would not be so bad. I mean, all right, a cylinder 
is phallic. I mean, I can see a thousand things in my room that are in some way phallic. This microphone, I'm holding right up to my face. <laughs> when I'm up in front of this uh, room, does it look like I'm talking into a bunch of robot penises? <laughs> All right, no Family Guy jokes. So, in addition... Can I to, conduct with my penis? To it being shaped like a penis. Can I podcast with my penis? You go right at it. You know what it shoots? It doesn't shoot water. Wait, 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 hold up. How can you... It says on every super soaker ever, do not put anything in here that is not water. Oh, this one doesn't shoot water on principle. In fact, the ad that is linked to in my thing of the day shows you that it in fact shoots a slimy liquid of some kind. Wait, how the hell does it do that if without clogging up the works? It's it, designed to. It shoots some sort of goop. It shoots a small stream of goop that flies out and covers goop things in goop. coming out of an alien phallus. Now, the, the, the kicker is that the advertisement shows this one kid like, all right, and he's holding this thing, and he pumps it a bunch of times, <laughs> and then he starts shooting it, and, and it's, it, all, it cuts to shots of little children shots. Like, like, like shots. holding their hands up like, ah, and then this goop hits him all over the face, bukake style. And then he pumps it up more and shoots out more goop up from the alien mouth. Now, uh, oh, my God. Now, it just doesn't get worse. Okay. What the fuck? Who did... There's, I only see one possibility. Normally I say, oh, I see... I know the possibility. What's that company that makes the Super Soaker? What's it called? Um, oh, I don't remember. Oh, I forget the name of the company. It doesn't matter. The people working for that company and designing Super Soakers, you know what they are? Pedophiles of the Bukake Feti. Now, now, no, see... That's what they are. What I could envision is... A designer who is angry at his job decided, you know what? Here's an idea for a toy, bastards. And the clueless executive said, all right, fine, and made it. Uh, I can't uh. imagine any other scenario. I can't imagine a human being on this earth over the age of nine who would not see that and think, that's a penis shooting semen at people. <laughs> uh, uh, you pump it and then it shoots goop and it's an alien phallus. Oh my god. It kind of reminds me of that Viking toy. You know how SNL used to always have those fake ads for fake toys or fake things like Super Happy Fun Ball? I guess. There was an ad once for this Viking thing. And they showed it like they put it in the living room. They turn it on. And it's a Viking that basically just sprays red dye around the room. <laughs> <laughs> what parent would let their kid play with this? I don't know. Though I used to have a squirt gun that shot uh, disappearing ink. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah, until you ran out of the ink and then you couldn't buy any more because the toy was already taken off the market. That sucks. That was awesome. Yeah. So, uh, do you have a thing of the day? I sure do. Does it involve pedophilia bukake? No, it involves violence. Ah, Ultra violence. Fuck. Yeah, so, in J on Japanese TV, there was a video of this guy riding down a mountain on a bicycle. Like downhill mountain biking or? No, it, it was a really weird mountain. Like, I think it was a volcano. Except it was really smooth. Like, if you wanted to go really, really fast, there's no better place than this. A perfectly smooth, downhill, kind of dirt. You get a lot of nice traction. And this guy was on a bike, and he went down the hill, and they recorded his speed at, like, 168 kilometers an hour at one point. I was like, holy shit, right? And then I guess he slowly stopped after that. Well, I can see that. I mean, biking down the meager hills that existed in Michigan when I was a kid, I once got my bike up to about 50 miles an hour. Yeah, so the next thing they show is this guy who's in all, he's wearing this red suit with a helmet, and he's all fancy-like, and he's got a really fancy-looking bike. Like, he's prepared to do this. Like, he's going to break a world record in, in how fast his bike is going to go downhill. Yeah, like he was in this fancy kind of looking bike too. Yeah, really fancy. The kind that has like three plastic spokes in the wheels and Yeah, like an actual downhill bike as opposed to the first guy who was just on some mountain bike. Yeah. The guy looks pretty buff too. Like he's like, "Grr, I'm going to go get this." Yeah, awesome. All right, Steve Volt. Steve Volt. So he starts going. He's going pretty fast. Whoosh, whoosh. He gets to a certain point and then the frame of the bike just collapses like the uh, front wheel goes uh, the uh, front wheel goes up and the part where the pedals are goes down 
Man, that's and like a fear I've had as a child. I was always deathly afraid of the fact that my front fork would suddenly break and I'd be killed. This by wasn't my own the bike. fork; it was it was behind the fork. It was like <laughs> where the fork, you know, reaches the handlebars, like right in there. It just went <laughs> right in half. That's a little too close to my balls. It was way close to his balls. So the guy, of course, flips over forward like a bajillion times. And, well, just watch the video and you'll see just how injured this guy gets. He tur- tur- From a pity dangerous looking dude, turns into an old beat the shit out of old man in like, uh, a, in like a second. I think the worst part is when his helmet flies off. Yeah. And, and you see that, wow, he's still, f- oh, Ooh, ooh, oh, oh. It just, and the, you see like parts of the bike I think hit him at the beginning. Uh, oh, painful to watch. Pain, even more painful to be that guy. He didn't die, but oh god, it's painful. Yeah. So if you like to watch people in pain, I don't know. I don't like to watch it, but it's just so. It's like watching a train wreck. It's exactly. You know what like, it's like? It's like watching those owned compilations on Google Video. Exactly. This is the ultimate owned. Ah. <laughs> uh. It's more, it's, it's more owned than any of the owns I've ever seen. I guess that is the difference. I mean, look, this is a Japanese TV thing, right? The guy got hurt, and the cameras kept rolling, and then they showed the horrible aftermath. Well, look, look at the consequences of what you decided to do. Mm-hmm. Anytime in America, when they're filming some sort of stunt and it goes wrong, they don't show you the aftermath. They show you, like, a pan back shot of paramedics, and that's it. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I guess it, it speaks well that, yeah, if something bad happens, at least report on it or show it. Yeah, hey, don't try this at home, you'll die. Yeah, I mean, if they make a show about someone jumping over ten school buses on a motorcycle and they mess up, that show doesn't actually ever make it to the air. You'll just see, like, a news story about it. It's when the guy, you know, see, when you watch a show on some channel about some a stunt, the guy always succeeds every time. Well, America. unless it's a Fox show, World's Blankiest Blank. <laughs> World's Blankiest Blank. We're going to do today's show on the history and whatnot of P2P file sharing thingies. Yeah, a few people have asked about it, and all the other topics you've asked about, we kind of went long in the news, so we don't want to spend a short episode on something big. Yeah, we're not going to get too technical into exactly how they work or how you can use them. Or copyright or anything like that. We're just going to talk about the history of P2P usage in general. Yeah, the how we discovered ne- it. The Since major networks, etc. Yeah, because basically the two of us, we're from the generation that lived through the dawn of the MP3 age, like, directly. We got some of the first MP3s, and we were along at every step of the way. Mm-hmm. And it, it startled me one day when someone at my work was talking about Napster, and they had no idea that Napster used to be the thing because they've only known Napster as that crappy Napster what it is today. Really? Wow, that wasn't until recently. Yeah, well, people who really weren't hip with it or people who were young or people who didn't care don't really know. And it's kind of a fascinating... But it was all over the news back in the day when it was for real. They didn't know what it was or they didn't pay attention. Okay, well, in the beginning, there was two things. Well, in the beginning, there was MIDI. (laughs) Well... (laughs) Okay. MIDI files were the beginning. You could get them from websites and Usenets. Yeah. And well, IRCs. One day. My and friend... FTPs. That was the beginning with those four things. Usenet, IRC, FTP, websites. One, two, three, four. Now, before Napster and peer-to-peer and all that, basically the only way to get MP3s, which were this elite thing, I mean, they were in that day like Wares was in the late 80s, early 90s. It was the thing that people would, like, collect and seek out and parter over and fight with, and it was fun. Yeah, there would be trades. They'd be like, hey, I'll trans, I'll wait, you know, the 20 minutes it takes to send this to you if you wait the 20 minutes it takes to send that to me. Yep. Or there were just blatant FTP sites where you'd log in, and it would, they had ratios where for every 10 megabytes you uploaded, you were allowed to download one megabyte. Yeah, a lot of IRC, cha- IRC channels that have bots in them, and you could... Send files to the bots, and then they would send you things back. And, of course, there were the MP3 sites, which would have thousands of links. Maybe five of them would work, but you'd click on every goddamn one. You didn't care what the song was. You'd download it. That's right. I got some shitty music because of that. (laughs) I think I got one song that way ever. Because I just didn't care. And then I forgot to, what, you had had to, like, burn it or something? Oh, you had to... uh, Scrape it. Uh, what was the, the word? What was the? It was an uh, MP3 cooked. You had to uncook MP3s. Yep. Because back then, 
no one no web server was set up to let you download mp3s binary mm-hmm. files so you would it wouldn't know mime types and it would just download ascii so you get an mp3 you go to play it and instead of music coming out the god awful screeches of the damned would come out of your speakers yep yep the only way to fix and it And Winamp was... would use your 100% CPU usage on your 486. Yep, yep. Or because you had a, a ISA sound card and an ISA uh, network card, you couldn't play MP3s and download websites at the same time. Yep. But one day, Napster appeared. Napster was God. Now, when it first appeared, there was about a two-week period where I didn't know anything about it. Like, I heard of it, and I thought it was something stupid. I thought it was like... MP3 sites, but for the masses. I heard the word Napster. I didn't know what it was. One day, eventually, I got around to using it, and holy crap. Well, one day in high school, this girl was sitting there. She said, eh, Napster is great, but half the songs I get don't sound right, and it takes forever to download them, and eh. And I said, why are you using Napster? Just go to FTP sites. Uh Then I got home, and I thought, huh. So I went on Yahoo, because back then that was what you searched with. There was no Google then. <laughs> and no I t- Google. I typed Napster, and I saw this website. And I wasn't sure what to make of it. Well, there was this protocol that they invented called OpenNap. Well, I don't think it was called OpenNap, but... It was called Nap, or so it was called Napster. Something like that. Basically, what it was is you would run a server, which is a Napster server. So it was still sort of a client-server deal, which is how they were able to shut it down in the first place. And the server had an IRC, and it let you chat with other people, and it let you send files to other people. And you could say, these are the files that I am sharing, or these are the directories I am sharing. And people could search, and based on file names, they could come up with files that other people were sharing and directly download them from other people. And you could say, I will allow X people to download from me at once, and... I will allow one person to download these many things for me at a time. And now, it was very primitive compared to the peer-to-peer you're used to today. Very primitive. You had to do everything manually. You had to, like, you'd find ten people who had the file you wanted. You picked the guy who was probably the fastest. And yeah, you couldn't just in. say get from everyone. You picked one guy. Now, searching was great because most stuff was on there, unless you listened to any good music. <laughs> well, no. The thing about Napster was that even though it was so primitive, so many people were using it. That, because there was no fear. Well, no, it's not that there was no fear. It's that you could find anything. Because it was just, it was like the Library of Alexandria when it comes to music and file sharing. Well, anything, Everything you could think of was there somewhere. Well, anything you could think of that was modern. Oh, yeah, yeah. You couldn't find old stuff. You couldn't find a lot of foreign stuff right away. You couldn't find old and foreign stuff, but anything that was ever really on the radio in America, you could find. Yeah, and really... Type in Elvis, every Elvis song. Type in Rolling Stones, every Rolling Stones song. Just ding, there they are. And no one really thought about it because no one was being sued. No one, Most people who used it didn't even think about it being illegal, mm-hmm. especially since it was from this legit-looking company. Yeah, people just did it. Everyone was happy. Everything was awesome. At college campuses, it was insane because everything was so fast. You'd be like, song, 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 song. Within a minute, everyone on the whole campus could have every single thing everyone else had. It was crazy. Yep, and it ushered in a new era. My MP3 collection, like, quintupled every day. It was the greatest. Absolutely. But then freshman year of uh, college is, what, 2000? Yeah. 2001-ish. They, uh... Started to block it and filter it, and eventually they killed it off pretty quick. Yeah, then it got sued, and it went down. Which sucked. Of course, right about that time, the peer-to-peer revolution happened, because Napster itself wasn't that great. It was just the first one. Well, it- there was other ones that were about while Napster was about, but none of them had the people to actually be useful. Well, because Napster came, it was the first one that took off, and the community was so big that that was it. You didn't need to go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Of course, as time went on, other ones appeared, and once Napster died, once we knew it was dead forever, all the other ones exploded. WinMX came out, Kazaa, Nutella finally got some users, you know, it, it, LimeWire, which is, I think, also Nutella. It just it got crazy, go nuts. Yep. Then there was WinMX. Oh, wait, wait. Hotline. Hotline was classic. I totally forgot about Hotline. Didn't you? You ran that Hotline server for a while. I sure did. It was really popular. We got lots of anime on that Hotline server. Yeah, we basically, Scott set up a Hotline server at RIT, and we got fan subs and shared them. Hotline was actually this really old thing 
you would run a hotline server and people with hotline clients could visit it. And hotline servers had files that were shared and rules about sharing the files. And you could upload things to a hotline server and you could have a message of the day. And you could chat on the hotline servers. They had all kinds of... It was just a server you could connect to with the hotline client and do all sorts of things on. And mostly people would go around looking for hotline servers and download files from them and upload files to them. Yep, it was real slick, it was real fun, and it slowly got shut down over time. I don't think it got shut down. I think something weird happened at the well, company. Not, not shut down, shot down. Oh, it got something weird happened at the company. It was a very strange situation. Yep, and then it stopped being updated, and then there were holes in it, and then other better things appeared. You know, we could probably use the hotline model combined with the BitTorrent model in some fashion. Yeah, the main problem with also hotline with the waste model somehow is that all these early peer to peers were very open because no one really worried about lawsuits. If you ran a hotline server, it was directly and easily traceable right to you. I mean, if you'll just visit it, you're running a server. Yeah, it's like hello, come visit my server. It's got good stuff. Some people, a lot of them, were password protected or secret. Like you had to know, oh, connect to this IP address with this password, mm-hmm. or go to this website and prove that you're not evil cops, and then we'll let you in. Oh, a lot of people would have things like, if you want the password to my hotline, go to this website, click on this thing, and then do this and that, and that way I get like five bucks whenever you do that stupid thing with an advertisement, and then you can get into my hotline. A lot of people made money that way. A lot of people made money that way, scarily. Now, these things were all great, but none of them really... Every, like, one would come up, and it'd be great, and then eventually, either from lawsuits or technologically or just community-wise, it would collapse. There's really no loyalty in the peer-to-peer world. No, nope, people would go wherever the files were. If anything weird started happening or if the user experience started to suck or if there were no new files or if users started being assholes... People would just leave and go find some other way to get their files. Whatever way was the easiest way to get files, people would go through any amount of hell to get that way to work, as long as the way itself was easy. Of course, it's still kind of that way. I mean, Supernova went down. People just jumped to Pirate's Bay and never looked back. Yep. Nobody remembers Supernova now. It's all Pirate Bay. Yeah. And Pirate Bay can't be taken down. It's not illegal. Yeah, there's Torrent Reactor, and there's Mini Nova, and there's a whole bunch of sites now. (laughs) They took out Supernova. Ooh, big deal. Now, anyway, peer-to-peer, because we just talked kind of wildly and openly about the history of it in no particular... What do you want? We're just trying to finish off this day so we can do our E3 day tomorrow. This oh, my God. This day is you, there, We have had so much breaking news for E3 during this podcast. Doesn't matter. Anyone out there who knows is reading all this stuff now, and they're just waiting because tomorrow we'll have insightful commentary as opposed to just information. All I have to say, and I'm not going to say any specifics, but when I picture Sony now... All I picture is the biggest ha-ha guy in the world. (laughs) The biggest ha-ha guy in the world? Because Sony's done. (laughs) Oh, my God. Sony's done. All right, anyway. So, peer-to-peer, all it means is that, nor in the old days, when we were talking about FTP sites or websites, if you download a file, you connect to a person, or you connect to a server, and you download the file in one go, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Peer-to-peer, everyone's a server, and everyone's a client. Mm-hmm. Everyone downloads from everyone. No one person or client is better or more authoritative than another person or client. Mm-hmm. Now, you might think, ah, but how does that work? Because it could be insecure and blah. Well, there's so many people that you can use algorithms to figure out who's good and who's bad. If you're downloading a file from a bunch of different people and they're all downloading it from you, you can do various uh, you know, MD5 type checksum things, hashes, and see hey, all the data from this guy is no good compared to everyone else's. I'm just going to block him. Yep. They didn't actually add that sort of functionality for a long time. It was mostly, in the beginning, it was mostly, there were a whole bunch of people, but you had to pick one guy. Yep. It wasn't until much later where you could download something from multiple people at once. And now, finally, we have BitTorrent, which is, you know, a whole bunch of people have different parts of the same thing, and then they all kind of pass it around until everyone's got the whole thing. Even though it's funny how the revolution kind of became full circle in terms of the interface. I mean, it went from going to sites, clicking on links, getting files, to loading special software, to loading crazier special software that was meta software for all the other softwares, to going to websites and clicking on links for files. Mm -hmm. Only now the links are awesome BitTorrent. And that actually work every time, mostly. Now, surprisingly, and I don't want to sound like the old man, I was better back in the day, but there really weren't assholes and griefers in the early days of peer-to-peer. 
No, it wasn't until the Kazaa days that there were assholes and griefers. Yeah, I mean, you if you search for an MP3 and it was called Elvis Whatever, you were guaranteed to get Elvis Whatever. There was no chance of accidentally getting lesbian porn instead. Yeah, even on the WinMX days, people would, you know, some people would say, hey, I don't want to let you upload. They'd cancel you unless you traded with them. But most people, you know, you click on a file, you'd get it. Most people would keep their program open and online all the time. So yep. you would just keep downloading until you got the whole thing. But then assholes appeared, and two, the recording industry decided to start flooding the networks with bad data. Yeah, and it seems that they're slowly shutting down all those peer-to-peer networks one at a time, except BitTorrent. Yeah, because BitTorrent really can't be shut down. BitTorrent is God. I mean, all the, we very briefly, we could explain how BitTorrent works. I already did. One guy sets up a tracker. I don't even think you need the trackers anymore. I'm not sure. There, think, is, there are ways to do trackerless I think they have torrents. trackerless torrents now. And you get these torrent files, and you download the torrent file. The torrent file is just a description of where the real file's at and how to get it. So you just download this little torrent file, and you run it with BitTorrent Client. The BitTorrent Client looks at the torrent file, and it says, okay, that's how I'm going to get this file. It goes around to the tracker... And the tracker says, okay, these are the people who have that file and are torrenting it right now. And then you hook up with all the other people who are torrenting the file that you want. And it starts getting pieces from all those different people at once. And as you collect pieces, if new people come around who don't have the pieces that you got, you give them the pieces that you got. And other people give you the pieces you don't got. And if there's a whole lot of people doing the same file at once, you can get the whole file pretty quickly. Because there's just so many people giving you pieces. But if there aren't so many people, then it takes a long time. If there's just one guy and you, you just directly download it from him really slowly. Now think about the huge advantage of this for, say, someone like us, where we host files. Say we wanted to make a compilation of, you know, the first five months of Geek Nights in one torrent, Mm -hmm. or one file, or one set of files. If we just had it to download... Every person who downloaded it would kill our server with a giant bandwidth bill, and we'd be fucked. Mm -hmm. If we had a torrent, if one person downloads it, it's the same as if we had a normal file. But if two people download it, ooh, we start saving bandwidth. And if a thousand people download it, not only does it save us a ton of bandwidth, but it's actually faster for everyone else to get the file than if we were just... As long as everyone downloads it at the same time. If one guy downloads it today and another guy downloads it tomorrow, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Unless the first guy... Because what you can do with BitTorrent is after you finish downloading something, you keep the window open and you don't close BitTorrent. And then you'll keep giving pieces to other people who don't have pieces. But, of course, you already have every piece of the file, so you don't need to get any more. You just keep giving and giving and giving to people who don't have it. But it's a very good poor man's way of doing load balancing. Mm -hmm. Say you've got a big file you want to share with people. In the old days, you just had to buy a big pipe and big servers. Mm -hmm. Now, say you have three servers or three places you can seed... You have those three places seed, and then the torrent file will start getting stuff from all three of those, thus balancing the load. And then if you get crazy popular suddenly, you get a swarm, and then you're okay because now the swarm takes care of itself. Yeah, if you're using BitTorrent as not like a shady one-man file sharing, but as a, you know, big corporation trying to, you know, distribute files easily, BitTorrent can work really well if you just set up like 10 or 20 computers to all uh, seed the torrents all the time. Freaking, that's great. Yeah, that's a really, really good way to balance load. Especially if you put like them in 10 different places around the net. Hey, we should start a company. We'll just buy 10 really big servers around the net, and we'll torrent your files from all these 10 places at once. You know, I was about to say the same thing. That's a really good idea. Yeah, just like 10 places around the country. Give us a file. We'll torrent it on all the machines at once. And then whenever anyone tries to get your torrent, it's guaranteed to be fast and wicked. Plus, I see in the future as torrent becomes more and more ubiquitous because it has already stood up to the test of time. Oh, yeah. Things that are in some ways slightly better or slightly different have come up and then immediately collapsed and disappeared because BitTorrent is just so... It's like MP3. Well, most of the things that have come up to be like BitTorrent are... Because BitTorrent was open source. I think it is open source still. And people seem to take the BitTorrent client and the BitTorrent server also. And they sort of remix it or add a feature or add a DRM or yeah change the way it looks or something evil like that. And they'll try to sell it or they'll try to say, you have to use our thing. You can't actually, you know, when it's really just BitTorrent with their name on it. 
and all kinds of weird stuff. So, yeah. Nothing else has really done the same thing BitTorrent has done. Yeah, or people have tried to do things better, but they didn't work as well. Mm. I mean, the, the model of BitTorrent on a high level of how it works is pretty much rock solid. They could probably do things on the low level to make it optimized better. But in terms of the concept, I think it's dead on, and I don't see anything usurping it anytime soon. No, I don't think so either. I mean, it, it's pretty much here to stay. You know, the music people and the movie people don't seem to be going after it because the guy who runs it made that agreement with them. They're going to go out to the torrent sites, but the, I don't think Pirate Bay is going to give up, which means they're pretty much screwed. Well, what Pirate Bay is doing is perfectly legal in their country. They cannot go after yeah. Pirate's Bay. The only way you can go after uh, the... BitTorrent people is if the ISPs continue to screw up BitTorrent. Our ISP is relatively nice when it comes to BitTorrent. They only do one little thing that's not so annoying to kind of hinder you from being a seed tracker guy. But Plus, I, even then, BitTorrent, it's very easy if you're a client to route around whatever they do to you. Yeah. Because especially, I mean, BitTorrent uses different ports and there are different ways to set it up. But for people who don't know anything about networking, I do recommend Azurius as a BitTorrent client. Uh, I just use the regular old BitTorrent client. Well, the not, the one difference is that Azurius, you can set one incoming port and tunnel it through your router. You can do that with BitTorrent normal also. No, yeah, you said you couldn't before. Yeah, you can. Because I asked and you said no. I said I, said I wouldn't want to. Huh? Why would I want to? If anyway, I, Azurius is really easy to use. It's Java. It's big and slow. And it's this giant freaking window full of crap. The bit, the real BitTorrent client's a nice little window. It's happy. Yeah, but it's I, simple. I, people out there seem to like Azurius, and I've noticed people I offer BitTorrent to tend to prefer it or don't really like the normal BitTorrent client. I don't know why. People, maybe it's because the maybe they didn't like the older BitTorrent client. They don't realize the new one doesn't suck as much. That might be. The other thing is I notice a lot of people who are using the newer the Azuriuses and whatnot. They seem to be wanting to, like, cheat the system or have more control over BitTorrent than you're supposed to. Like, they'll be like, oh, you know, I want to use this so I can, you know, not upload as much. And it's like, no, you should upload as much as you can. You're kind of, you know. Well, it depends. It depends on what kind of connection you're on. I mean, if you're on a symmetrical cable connection where you're well, symmetrical well, that, the in terms regular of BitTorrent client has one slider and you slide that slider to what your connection is and that's it. You know, these other clients, they have things like, don't share it all for this file, you know, do this for that one. And it's all these extra controls that make it more complicated that really don't need to be there. Yeah, but it's nice to have them there. I mean, people don't seem to use them that often, except for a handful of assholes out there. Yeah, it's, but I know it's most of them, I don't know. I just don't see the point. It's like, why, what are you going to use them, never? No, you never know. It depends on what's your situation. What kind of situation could it be where you would need more controls than the, what the regular BitTorrent client gives you? If you've name got a one, weird... th Name one thing that Azurius has that the regular BitTorrent client doesn't that you need. Nothing. Or MicroTorrent. Nothing. Yeah. So there's not much more we can really say about P2P without going into super technical whatnots. So, uh... E3 tomorrow. Woot! And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows, it's actually recorded at night.